Welcome, Ecom Logistics Nation. Thank you for joining today's episode. We're on a mission to share e commerce logistics insights, trends, successes, and challenges from the leaders and innovators in our space. When you look at the fact that over $26 billion was invested in quick commerce and not one of those companies went prop- uh, went public or became profitable, shows you how foolish the model is in the United States. Had someone invested $26 billion in India, they'd really be doing quite well today. So that's really the lesson to take away from that. Welcome Ecom Logistics Podcast Nation. Due to popular demand and with so much more to chat about, Nanad and I are really excited to welcome back to the show, global supply chain consultant, Britton Ladd. If you missed our first conversation, definitely recommend checking it out. It's titled How to Revamp E-Commerce Fulfillment Through Partnerships, and we released that episode on December 5th. Britton, welcome back, and thank you for joining us a second time today. Oh, my pleasure. I really enjoyed the first time I got to speak with everybody. So I'm absolutely happy to be back. Well, it's great to have you back. And we're excited to really jump into a couple of couple of really relevant topics. Would love to start with Amazon in the US and, and maybe even beyond Amazon, the grocery space, how Amazon is playing in that space. And and there's a lot of different things going on, like <clears throat> that we'd love your insight and perspective. We're, we're just about five years post the acquisition of Whole Foods. So I'm sure there's a, a look back on how that's going. You know, we're hearing more and more today about Amazon Go, the cashier less store concept. And maybe a good starting place, a post you recently read or recently wrote on LinkedIn that like just like had my mind buzzing was on, you know, in the grocery online order segment, a grocery store loses on average seven to fifteen dollars for every online order they fulfill. And we all know that's a a razor thin margin business to even just to begin with. And and then you layer in that loss every time someone is placing an order. And I think, you know, it's certainly reflective of what you wrote about and how Amazon's making a pivot there, you know, before, and I think that pivot starts like March 1st. I mean, it's, it's right around the corner here where before, if you placed an order online, you had to get yeah, the, the cart size had to be 35 bucks and you got free shipping. And they just jumped that tremendously to $150. So, you know, in all of that, there's so much, you know, would love to get your insights and what the heck is going on and, and what you're seeing. Well, it's it's really interesting when I think back on all this. So to that post that you're referring to. I receive an awful lot of questions from people who are LinkedIn members and people who are not on LinkedIn and so forth, people who listen to these podcasts. And they constantly ask me, like, do do retailers make a lot of money through online sales? And I say, no. (laughs) I say, most of them lose money on every order. And so let's step back a minute because I got to explain why we're where we are at today. So prior to the pandemic, only 3% of all grocery sales were online, only 3%. So CEOs were like, it's only 3% of my business. Who cares? I'll let Instacart do it, or maybe my employees will take care of it. And if I don't make any money on it, it's fine because it's only 3% of my customers. And then COVID hit. And when COVID hit, it flipped the script. Now everybody wanted groceries delivered online. So the grocery retailers are like, this is great. You know what? We're going to have all this volume. And when COVID's over, we're going to keep all these great customers. And now I'm going to have an ability to actually start being profitable. But what these CEOs failed to realize is that the math in groceries doesn't work. Meaning, unlike other businesses where you can scale and you can lower costs, the more scale that you have, It doesn't work like that in groceries. For simple math, if it cost me $10 to fulfill one online online order, it's still going to cost me $10 to fulfill a thousand online orders. Each individual order is still going to cost me $10. There is no automated picking going on at the, at the store shelf. So you still have, you still have individuals who run around and fulfill these orders. And lo and behold, these CEOs were like, oh, my goodness, we're we're losing money. 
And so they were asking me and asking some other consultants, so how much do you think we're losing on average? So when we looked at the data, what we discovered was that on average, it's between seven to $15. That's on average. Some of the grocery retailers we looked at were losing $25 or more. And as I've stated, you know, Amazon loses more money per order than anyone else. And that's because of the lack of a, of what I would call a best in class distribution fulfillment network for Amazon Fresh Groceries. So the reason why I wrote the post was to really point out that online grocery retailing is actually a terrible model. In my opinion, I think it's one of the worst models ever created because the only way it works is if you use automation. And that's how I also started writing about micro fulfillment. And that's what some retailers are, are moving towards. So if you look at the grocery retailer, HEB in Texas, if you read my LinkedIn post, I've written about HEB. HEB arguably has the most advanced and sophisticated grocery store anywhere in the world located in Plano, Texas. So now you're losing seven to $15 on 10% of your business. So I cheered when Amazon finally made the announcement about a month ago, whatever it was, that they were going to increase the delivery fees. It used to be, as we were speaking before the podcast, Dan, you know, you had to have like a $35 order to get anything free. Now it's $150. Here's the thing, though. Amazon is still going to lose money on every single Amazon Fresh order that they fulfill. So even though Amazon appears to have made a big move and the overall scheme of things, they're still running a business like all the other online grocery retailers are doing. Uh, all the other grocery retailers are doing with their online business. They're all running a business where they're losing money. So at some point, this is all going to collapse. And so this is where retailers are going to have to make a decision sooner rather than later. Am I going to automate with automated micro fulfillment and put them in my stores or among a cluster of stores? Or am I just going to wash my hands of online and say, we'll fulfill an order? Of course we will, but only at the actual cost. Now, yeah, I, I mean, Burton, on, on that side, the, you know, there's the consumer perspective. I want now, I, I've tasted blood, my friend. I want that delivery, right? Like that is what I expect in my my routines have been, I don't know, when was the last time I did physical grocery shopping? And I used to love doing that, right? I still do a little bit of fresh fruits and whatnot that I will, but the consumers are very in tuned to this. So I don't think the grocery companies have an option, but to try and figure this out. And it sounds like it's only going to be in the hands of the folks that have the capital investment necessary to be able to deploy micro fulfillment, right? And it's like, how many micro fulfillment? Because each of these, you know, you spoke about auto store. If the, if the range and reach, because today the grocery stores are, you know, you, you, I have a Walmart, you know, within five miles of either direction of my house at this point, right? Maybe there is one to cover that entire area, but in major metros, you are looking at, seven, eight, nine, ten of these. And each of them require at least a 10 to $15 million investment on the capital side when it comes to, you know, you spoke about auto store and cold automation, et cetera. It's only going to become a game that can be played by people that have that type of capital investment where they can prove out the ROI to be able to do this. So it's interesting. Right? It's, it's, so it's interesting. So in terms of the price, a good micro fulfillment system would run you between two and four million and that's installed. Now you can set that price up depending on how some, some, some of the things you may do. It'd be rare that you're gonna be in the 10 to 15 million unless you have a really big store like an HEB and they put in a massive micro fulfillment center like HEB did with Auto Store. But you have the company Adabotics, you have Adverb, you have BrightPick, you have Takeoff, you have, you have Fabric. So there are these options out there, but you bring up a great point. So one of the things that I've really argued with the grocery retailers about is if it's only 10% of your business, why not just simply outsource it? And I've made the argument to Instacart that you have the wrong model, Instacart. What Instacart should be doing is saying, we'd like to buy the naming rights for all of your online business. We'll fulfill your, we'll fulfill the orders with our groceries and we basically will pay a percentage of it back to you. And mm -hmm. 
Instacart has an opportunity to go to Atabotics or Auto Store or whoever and basically say, we were, we're going to invest in you and we're going to open up our own micro fulfillment centers, but we're going to fulfill orders for Kroger and Albertsons. We're going to fulfill orders, you know, for Hy-Vee. We're going to fulfill orders for really anybody. And so why don't you collaborate with us and we'll do the micro fulfillment centers and you don't have to put out the capital outlay. We'll just charge you a maintenance fee access to software fee, and we'll charge you a per transaction fee. Now, all of these fees will still be lower than what it would cost you to do this on your own or cost you to do it through the old Instacart model. And there are other companies that actually could do this. So I that's what I'm waiting to see. That to me is the most intelligent way to do this. But there are grocery retailers that are moving on their own to micro fulfillment. The other thing that we have to talk about when it comes to like Amazon is Andy Jassy, and I'm, I'm a big fan of Andy Jassy. I really like him a lot. You know, Andy Jassy's in, in, in a no-win situation. So he's being tasked with growing Amazon at a time when Amazon's really not growing. And he has to come up with an idea to do something with the grocery business. So one of the things that Amazon keeps saying publicly is that we're going to go big on physical retail. We're going to go big. The problem is everything they've tried with physical retail for groceries really hasn't done anything. My argument to Amazon is this. You spent $13.7 billion on June 16th, 2017 to acquire Whole Foods. What planet are you living on to where you convinced yourself that now you have to have Amazon Fresh stores? And the Amazon Fresh stores are going to be like a traditional grocery retail store. And I said, time out. I said, that's not what you want to do. Just simply create Amazon, just simply create Whole Foods Plus stores. Whole Foods Plus stores are the stores where you could get branded CPG products and all kinds of fruits and vegetables, not just organic. You get your Tide and your Coke and your Pepsi and all this there, and you would leverage the Whole Food brand name. Call it Whole Foods Plus. And so what I recommended to Amazon was rebrand the 33 Amazon Fresh stores they have. But even think about rebranding the Amazon Go stores, because although Amazon Go's are fairly popular, they're not taking market share from anyone because a lot of people just walk by Amazon Go and they're like, oh, this is an Amazon Go store. I've read about that. And they go inside. They like, ooh, this is so cool. And I can walk out and all this. But they don't go back. And that's the thing that's challenging for Amazon. They're not bringing a lot of customers back into those stores. But I'm convinced if suddenly Amazon Fresh becomes Whole Foods to go. Now I think we have something. And, and, and if nothing else, I really recommend to Amazon to pilot it. Leverage the Whole Foods brand name, which is really very popular, and start giving people an identity with groceries. I'll end it by saying this. I still believe that the mistake Amazon made, in addition to not leveraging the Whole Foods brand, is that Amazon failed to acquire Target. When I made the recommendation to Amazon in 2013 to acquire Whole Foods, I said within two years, acquire Target and open up Whole Foods markets inside Target stores. Target now has nearly 2,000 stores. Amazon has only around 560 total stores. Amazon is a minnow in an ocean, and Amazon yep. is at a severe disadvantage. So I would like to see Amazon make an acquisition. I just don't think Amazon's in a position to make a big acquisition of Costco, which is another one I recommended, or acquire Target. At a minimum, I think they should at least acquire Kohl's. But Amazon really is in a world of hurt when it comes to their grocery business. So I've, I've gone through the motions of opening, you know, stores and networks, right? So, you know, I partook in the distribution network creation for Target when they entered Canada, as an example. And I've seen the amount of pain <laughs> that you have to go through to set up just 124 stores, right? That, that was the kind of starting point. So I, I wholeheartedly agree. It should be an acquisition strategy. And that's probably what's going to happen. You know, I, some of the names you mentioned. Yeah, about 75 Sorry? to 80 billion. Had Amazon done this in 2015, had Amazon acquired Whole Foods in 2013, if they would have acquired Target in 2015, they would have only spent about $45 billion to acquire Target in 2015. Target massively grew and became so much more profitable, you know, from 2015 to the present. So this hesitation that Amazon had is really coming back to bite them. Well, you wrote recently to Britain about recommendation for maybe Target 
you know, battling up and making an acquisition as well. So I think you had mentioned, wouldn't it be interesting if Target acquired Instacart or FedEx, right? So, I mean, we've talked a lot about Amazon and Walmart, but how do you see Target potentially playing here in the next couple of years? Well, since we brought up Target, let me finish this point on Amazon. Target really has some interesting things they can do. One of the things Target did back in 2015, I believe it was, they sold their pharmacy business to CVS for $1.9 billion. And I think it'd be interesting for Target to say, do we really want to be in the grocery business or do we want to sell our grocery business? Conservatively, they would they would generate several billion dollars of profit if they were to sell that business on Amazon. It'd be a way for Amazon to buy Target's grocery business and still get Whole Foods markets. So win win for both of those companies. If Target didn't want to sell it to Amazon, they could sell it to maybe HEB at Texas. The challenge is going to be it has to be a non-union grocery retailer. So that's going to be kind of tricky. Can you just but tell you me, because I'm not, when you say, because I know that the CVS, it, you know, they basically own that infrastructure within the brick and mortar, right, of Targets. Are you, are, is your thought here that Amazon would have like the branded grocery within a Target physical store? Is that what you're? Correct. Yeah. They, what they would do is, it, it's really no different than what I, I suggested in 2013. My argument to Amazon was, Whole Foods is really small and it's hard to scale Whole Foods across, you know, neighborhoods or across cities and states, I should say, because it has such a small consumer base, people who only eat organic foods. So I made the argument to Amazon. However, if you acquire Target and you open Whole Foods markets inside Target stores, you now can also open up the branded CPG business. Doesn't technically have to fit within that model, but it could still be in the store. So what I'm saying is Amazon could approach Target or Target could approach Amazon and say, we'd like to sell our grocery business. And let's say they want 15 billion for it, which isn't out of line, frankly, for the business that they have. Amazon would open up Whole Foods markets inside Target stores inside their physical store. So you now have a place to go do your retail shopping and your grocery shopping all under one roof. Makes complete sense, man. Just to mix this up, okay. and this is based on our last conversation that we had. What I found really interesting is your background also working with e-commerce and logistics and the general space in India. Yes. And I want to do this podcast where we kind of mix this up. So we spoke about Amazon. We spoke about Target. What's happening in the market on the U.S. domestic side. I want to talk a little bit from your experience on what's happening in India, because it's, first of all, we have never spoken about it on this podcast or we have never brought that up. And I, and you know, us here at Ecom Logistics Podcast, like we really think it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And yeah, everyone knows the rise of China. China's, you know, it, it 1.5 trillion in GMV last year, right? The US right behind it at about 875 billion. India sitting only at about 100 billion in GMV in total e-commerce sales right now. But it is expected just over the next three to four years to cross over 400 billion in, in GMV, right? And that there is massive investment push in the market as well. Amazon's the perfect place to start on that front, mm -hmm. right? Amazon entered the Indian market in 2013 with one hand tied to their back. And just uh, let me explain a little bit on that side. It basically said, you can do B2C if it's a completely foreign owned company, right? Which Amazon happens to be which means it had to compete with existing giants while it could not do 1P directly, which is, you know, a major share of what Amazon does in the US comes from 1P. Of course, their marketplace, the 3P marketplace is significant. But in India, they had to play the game where it was just playing a 3P. And now, you know, about 7% of their revenue represents what they call B2B, which is doing more like what Uline would do, provide like stationaries, business to business, but they cannot buy anything like buy something from Johnson & Johnson and actually sell it directly to the consumer. So they got to depend on the market. And they are now starting to become, or if I'm not mistaken, has become the largest marketplace competing with a localized marketplace called Snapdeal. What's your perspective on that, that market? 
how is it different from the us market like you have lots and if you can also explain why do you have experience with india <laughs> well the reason why i have experience with india is that i've been so fortunate over the years that i got to work with multiple companies in india uh, i got to work with india through deloitte when i was a consultant i am so grateful that i've been able to travel throughout india and over a period of several months i was able to go to 27 of the 29 states i just think india is really a fascinating place but what i was really doing when i was traveling around the country is i was actually assessing their logistics infrastructure their business communities i was assessing you know their agriculture all of this and what i saw was an awful lot of problems but an awful lot of potential and so when i think of india today I really frame a discussion with India from this perspective. At once India, at one time China was rising, China's now falling. China's now falling. India is rising. India has a much younger population than China. And when we look to the future, India's population is going to significantly be much more younger than the population in China. And so I really say that that it's not that China is the crouching tiger or the hidden dragon. It's really India. India is really the crouching tiger. Just so happens that India is more like a cub, a tiger cub at this moment, but it's going to rapidly grow. Amazon really continues to struggle. I was never a big fan of India entering the market. My argument to India, my argument to Amazon and Walmart was stuck. Time out. Force India to change their rules before you enter the market. Because if you don't do it before, once you enter that market, it's their playing field. They can pull the ball back anytime they want. And in one of my favorite posts or one of my favorite articles I wrote for Forbes magazine, I called it Walmart's Vietnam. And I also talked about Amazon and I made the argument that really what's happening is that I see a lot of parallels between Walmart and Amazon entering India, just as I saw parallels of the United States entering Vietnam, which became the Vietnam War. I would, no matter how hard Amazon tries and no matter what great ideas Amazon comes up with, the Indian government basically pulls the ball back right when Amazon wants to kick it. Walmart was smart. They acquired Flipkart. Flipkart is an India-based startup. So I think Amazon is going to continue to struggle. I don't, I would not be surprised if at some point, you know, Amazon looks for a partnership or Amazon sells their business. Unfortunately, Amazon just can't acquire someone. You know, it's very challenging. Amazon, there's a lot of restrictions in that regard. But I think that India is honestly going to invest billions, as we were talking earlier, about 150 billion. They're going to invest in the logistics infrastructure. That's absolutely going to be critical. The other thing that's going to happen is that as the Indian consumer begins to have more disposable income, as they become more wealthy, they're going to demand much more services, much more different types of retail. And so I've been fascinated to watch how India is changing. For those of you who don't know, what makes India so fascinating is they have what's called the Karanas, the Karana stores. These little tiny mom and pop shops that, yep. have, been in, that have been in those families for generations. And there are literally millions of these Karanas throughout India. And so instead of trying to put them out of business, which at one point Amazon was trying, and it was a terrible decision. Flipkart and Walmart and now Amazon are saying, well, how do we make friends with the Karanas? And we sell inventory to the Karanas. The Karanas store some of it in their little shops, but we give them the ability to have customers come in and look online and order the product through the Karana. So that's a smart move yep. on their part. But all in all, do I do I think India is fascinating? So, I mean, you know, uh, both the things that you mentioned just now, right? One is... And I, I'm not an advocate of doing stuff like this. Like every country has got to do it, whatever works best for them. One of the things that out of everything that we discussed at the end of the day, it's what the big box. What about the main street? Right. And so one of the things with India, I can tell you is the main street is very, very powerful, right? Like that local mom and pop business. So you give the example of the, the Kirana and now you are starting to see them feel the heat. And I can tell you the buying patterns are changing where the local businesses are getting impacted because bulk purchases, same day delivery, logistics, environment improving, you are starting to see that push out. And not advocating this, right? But from a government perspective, they are saying we need to come in and help this 
help the environment and level the playing field to say we are not going to have one or two or three large players dominate the market and that's where everything like break down the monopolies so the government recently announced i think it's called ondc open network for digital commerce which essentially flattens the playing field by saying we are going to create our own marketplace it's simply put they are essentially saying we are going to create an environment that allows and prioritizes local over national and over monopolies straight up if you read the manifesto the government's essentially saying we are not going to let any of these monopolies win we want the local businesses to win which is a very unique where now what do you do when the government starts playing with you and that's the challenge that and I, also this morning while i was researching i found out amazon's actually partaking in that network as the logistics arm right while the government's trying to compete with them on the marketplace side of things correct super interesting it is because amazon's smart amazon says we can't control this but we can be part of it and if we're part of it eventually we can influence it so that's really what amazon's end game is uh, I think it's a smart move by the Indian government. I really do. You know, the, the thing that's also very interesting of what's going on in India is that there, there, is, there is a shift in the Indian consumer significantly. The Indian consumer is really becoming more aware of the challenge of turning over an entire country to foreign owned businesses. And they look to the United States and they look at what's going on in China. And so I think the person we have to speak about also in any type of discussion about India is Mukesh Ambani, the chairman of Reliance Industries. He, he's the owner of Geomart. And what he's basically doing is saying, and he's whispering in the ear of Prime Minister Modi of saying, you know what, we've got to protect India or these big foreign retailers are going to come in. And what Mukesh Ambani says is actually quite interesting. He frames it from a nationalist perspective. He says data is the new oil for the colonists. And the last yep. thing we can do as India is have Walmart and Amazon own that data because it's as if we're turning it over to the colonists. Now, he knows that there's actually a much better relationship between the United States and India. It's not really adversarial. But what he sees yep. is that if we as India don't control the data and if we in India don't control our destiny, then it's going to be left up to chance of any other retailer that wants to come in. So I think it's going to be fascinating to see how does this really turn out? What really happens at the end of the day? And what I imagine is this. I think you're going to see a lot of Indian ownership of a lot of this stuff, but then it's going to plateau. Around it is going to be better businesses, either in China or Europe, the United States or Latin America, whatever. And then people are going to say, well, wait a minute. So how do we gain access to this new way yep. of doing things, this new business model? Because we can't just copy it. And that's when I think then the next stage of India happens where there's more opening of the borders, more willingness to bring in businesses. But they're going to copy what China did. China says, of course, you could come to China. You just simply have to give us access to your proprietary information. We'll let you operate Agreed. freely, but we're going, we need access to your proprietary information. And I think that's really what I refer to as phase two in India, that they're going to open up the country to everybody in return for you giving them access to that, pri that proprietary information, because India saw how well it worked for China. And China is the world's manufacturer because they did that. And now when India looks to the future, India has to, India has to say, how are we going to employ all of our people? How do we keep, yep. you know, how do we keep employment increasing? How do we keep, you know, disposable incomes increasing? How do we bring more people into, you know, the upper classes versus being a middle class or poverty stricken and so forth? That means they have to invite many, many more businesses into the country because they can't create all this on their own. So that's what I'm really looking for. And I think that's going to start to happen right around 2030. That India is going to say, we've done it. We protected ourselves. It's still not enough. We've got to get more businesses in here. I mean, it's simply put, right? Uh, okay. India's population, I think the news is going to hit either next month or the month after. One of those two months where the, the clock ticker that says who's the world's 
who has the most population really? in the world right now it's china and it's india and i think the number is at a point where in the next two months india becomes Correct. the highest and it will continue sustaining after that because china has got a declining population from a replacement rate standpoint and as you pointed out from a youth standpoint india has got a much younger population so you're going to see that now if you play that out you know if china's e-commerce market is 1.5 trillion and you know you see the the gdp growth over the last 30 years from a india standpoint it has done about 6% rate for close to 22 of those 30 years or 23 of those 30 years right you're going to continue seeing that pattern so if the gmv rate of china is 1.5 trillion you can imagine where india is going to end up going as the economy continues growing and the middle class continues you know uh, growing as well and you are going to see a massive infrastructure, massive investment into the build of the e-commerce network, specifically speaking. I think that's what's going to get really interesting is everyone's going to want access to the market and how much does the government actually allow for that to happen. But it's also, it behooves India to be able to do that. You are seeing, you know, manufacturing, iPhones are being, you know, they are starting to manufacture them in India as an example. So there's quite a bit happening. I think it's, it's phenomenal even in the logistics space in particular, like if you were to talk to like delivery, $1.4 billion in investment in just one logistics, modernized third-party logistics. I haven't seen any of that type of investment go into uh, domestic uh, US market as far as logistics companies from a startup perspective are concerned, right? So you're seeing this investment in the market and I find it really curious. Just maybe to to close out, like how do you see the differentiation in the quick commerce market between India and the United States, right? So we got, you know, our DoorDash and Instacart and whatnot. And in India, you got the the Swiggies and the Zomatos, right? Like how do you, are there lessons to be learned either from the US uh, companies that the Indian companies should be adopting or Indian companies uh, should be looking at the US market? Well, what a fact, what the fact of the matter is, is this. India is an ideal location for quick commerce. Because there are so many cities within India that have a highly dense population, very densely populated. So they have large numbers of people in very small areas, but it's not necessarily small areas. They have large large numbers of people across a very wide city. So it's ideal for quick commerce. And that's what Zomato and Swiggy figured out. They're like, this is really ideal for us because they can maximize the cubulization on any vehicle they use. They can leverage people to walk or use little scooters and make these deliveries. So really, India is an ideal location for quick commerce. The problem in the United States, and remember this, the real estate is much cheaper there. Labor is much cheaper there. Everything. In the United States, you have high retail costs, high labor costs, and then you have an awful lot of restrictions. And then you have to basically have to pay, you know, these couriers But the model is such that you only are doing about two deliveries an hour in quick commerce for each person. In India, I believe that number is like 20, 20 deliveries per hour for individuals who work as as Zwiggy and Zomato. So it makes perfect sense for India in terms of quick commerce. Only a few places in the United States doesn't make sense. And even then, it's really a challenge. As we have seen, I mean, I've written probably more posts about this than anyone. And I made the argument that anyone in quick commerce who started in New York signed their death warrant because I wrote a post called that New York was going to be the well, it's going to be the graveyard of empires. I took that from, of course, Afghanistan. And it turned out to be true. All of these all of these rapid grocery delivery companies that started in New York have all died. They've literally all died or they're on their deathbed. Had they entered India instead by partnering with people locally there and said, this is our idea, we'll fund it, you start the company, we'll give it a name that's going to be cool in India, but we'll work with you as a partnership. That would have been a much smarter investment. When you look at the fact that over $26 billion was invested in quick commerce and not one of those companies went proper, went public or became profitable, shows you how foolish the model is in the United States. Had someone invested $26 billion in India, they'd really be doing quite well today. So that's really the lesson to take away from that. Absolutely. 
Awesome. Awesome. Well, listen, Britton, you have delivered. Thank you for being our first two time <laughs> guest to the show. And maybe just a quick reminder to, to the audience where they could follow you. Certainly recommend everyone follows um, Britton on LinkedIn. But yeah, if you could please share share that contact info. Yeah, really. You can always reach out to me via LinkedIn. My email address is bclad48 at gmail.com. You can follow me on Twitter, Britain underscore lad. Anytime you have anything you want to talk about, feel free to reach out to me. I connect with everyone who reaches out to me via LinkedIn. I always respond to people when they reach out to me. So don't be afraid to, to reach out. And whatever you do, don't do this, because I hear people say this to me more, more and more. They say, wow, you're really much nicer than I thought you'd be. And I say, why do you say that? They say, well, your picture on LinkedIn is so fierce. I was afraid to reach out to you. That's just a picture from a Fox News broadcast. I didn't choose it for any other reason that I thought it was a nice picture. But trust me, you can reach out to me about anything. I'm actually quite approachable. And I dearly love it when people do contact. Very approachable. Yeah. Great the, guy. The, yes. The, this was not planned, right? What you just said, because I was actually going to close with that. I'm like... Britain's much more approachable than his picture on LinkedIn <laughs> because it is so true. The first time I saw the picture, I'm like, this guy's going to keep me alive, man. <laughs> and Britain's an amazing yes. human being. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me back on the show. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Ninad Acharya, CEO and co-founder of Fulfillment IQ. And I'm here with... Dan Call, CRO and partner at Fulfillment IQ. We're the team behind the Ecom Logistics Podcast. Our mission is to provide you with genuine insights from our work alongside logistics leaders to help you improve your supply chain. In the Ecom Logistics Podcast, we share the knowledge and the insights we've gained from working alongside amazing brands, retailers, 3PLs, and VCs, so you can make the most out of your supply chain journey. If you like what you're hearing, we truly appreciate your support with a five-star rating on your favorite podcasting channel. Your feedback not only keeps us going, but also helps others find the podcast. If you think Fulfillment IQ can assist you, or if you have an idea related to logistics, just reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm always up for a chat and ready to explore new possibilities together. Stay tuned to the Ecom Logistics Podcast on your favorite podcast platform for fresh and practical insights into e-commerce and logistics. Until next time, let's keep making a difference in logistics together.